Hi there. My name is John Rallison. I am the pastor of Journey of Life Lutheran Church in Orlando, Florida, and you have somehow hooked up with this thing we call Dig Deeper, which are Bible enrichment studies for individuals and small groups. You want to come and visit us? We'd love to have you there. We're in the Lake Nona area of Orlando. Our website is www.journeyoflife.org. We do these studies every week, kind of as a uh, continuing discussion on whatever the sermon topic is for the week. We are beginning a series on the kingdom of God. Mark 1 verse 15 records Jesus' basic message this way. He says, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And the word gospel just means good news. So Jesus says the time is now, the kingdom of God is here, so repent, think differently, let your mind be changed, and believe the good news. So right in the middle of that is this idea of kingdom of God, and we're going to be spending the next few weeks, and I'm not even sure how long, exploring what this kingdom of God is. But before we do anything more, we're going to give you a chance to have a question if you're in a small group. And the question is this, what is one rule you didn't like when you were a kid? Hit the pause button if you're in a small group and I'll see you in five seconds. All right, I'm back. Here we go. So we're looking at this idea of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And it's basically the same thing. Uh, the writers in the New Testament tend to use the word kingdom of God when they're writing to a non-Jewish audience and kingdom of heaven when they're writing to a Jewish audience uh, because God is more general and it, it, um, it makes it more accessible to people without a Jewish background. So the New Bible Dictionary has this to say about the kingdom of heaven. He says the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God is the central theme of Jesus preaching according to the synoptic gospels. And the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they all write from generally the same perspective. That's what synoptic means, same view. Uh, John takes quite a different uh, look at things, but still a very uh, rich, and in some ways richer maybe, it's a later gospel. Anyway, we don't need to go off onto that. I want to give you some Bible verses from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The way Mark records the beginning of Jesus' ministry is this. It's in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And again, gospel is good news. So, then we get to Luke. And Luke has a longer bit of writing about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So let's look at that. Jesus doesn't actually use the phrase kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven in Luke's account, but you can see as we, and you will hear if you're just listening, as we go through this, that the idea is that the kingdom of God is at hand, it is now. So let me read this to you. It's Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So, Jesus doesn't actually use the word kingdom of God, but the scripture that he reads from Isaiah is clearly a messianic prophecy about the coming kingdom of God. It is the year of the Lord's fla fa flavor. <laughs> we'll get to the Lord's flavor someday. I, I like to have my heart be the Lord's flavor, but this is the year of the Lord's favor, and uh, uh, people who are oppressed are given liberty, uh, things like that, uh, along with the miraculous part like recovery of sight to the blind. And so Jesus says, uh, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It's the same thing as, as we saw from Mark before um, about how now it's here, it's now, and it is fulfilled. And what I want to do today, Jesus said today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the idea of something being fulfilled begs the question, well, what is is being fulfilled what happened or what was said that now is being fulfilled and so for today's study what I want to do is look backwards we're gonna spend this episode of dig deeper examining the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in the Old Testament so we're gonna start with a quote here from the Lexham Bible Dictionary and this is what it says about the Old Testament and references to the Kingdom of God. It says, in the Old Testament specific references to the Kingdom of God are relatively rare and occur after the initiation of the Israelite monarchy. That's uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. However, Martin Buber has argued that the Israelites understood the concept of God as king prior to the establishment of the Israelite monarchy. The notion of gods as kings was a basic belief for ancient Semites. That's before the formation of the Jewish nation. References to the Lord's kingdom are found in Obadiah, Chronicles, Psalms, and Daniel. Additional kingship terms can be used to indicate the concept of God's kingdom. And what I want to argue for you and present to you is the idea that God created the universe to be his kingdom. And then he put man in charge of it. And uh, man obviously has, you know, done a number on it. And so the kingdom needs restoration, which is what happened in Jesus. But let's begin by going all the way back to the beginning, the book of Genesis. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, here is a way you can look at this. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then he says what? Let them have dominion. And we're going to see in a moment that God's uh, authority is never really handed off as though he doesn't have his authority as God. But it is handed off as in uh, delegated. And that's really what's going on here. And, and so part of uh, the image of God is man's dominion over the earth, that, that uh, God is the ruler of all, and he has handed the rulership of earth over to mankind. And this is kind of, a, um, there is a, a sense, and I've read this about some uh, ancient Middle Eastern societies, and probably others too, that the image of the king represents the presence 
of the king and really brings the king's will to bear into wherever that image is because it's a reminder that this is a place that's under the dominion of the king. I read a, a account of Margaret Thatcher one time where uh, when she was prime minister and evidently she always carried these big handbags and uh, the handbag was like, you know, her symbol and she was going to be late to a meeting one time and evidently she had one of her assistants take her handbag and take it to the conference room where they are meeting and she and set the handbag in the center of the table and that was like her presence and everybody when they came to the meeting they came in and they shuffled in quietly and sat down and sat up straight quietly waiting for the arrival of Margaret Thatcher the prime minister because her handbag was already there and so it 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 uh, the handbag brought her presence even though it obviously wasn't exactly her presence. But here God hands off dominion of the earth. He says, you're going to be, you're in my image, and so you're going to have dominion over this. Uh, Sub-dominion, really. And then we get to uh, the very end here, almost the end of Genesis chapter 1. This is verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And so what we have here is that God has created everything and then he has handed dominion of this kingdom, the kingdom of the earth, over to man, mankind, to rule over it. And God saw that this was good. God saw that, that his image as creator and one with dominion being... Uh, delegated down to mankind over this world was a good thing. And so there we already have, that's dominion is kingdom. It's where someone's in charge. Uh, and, and that's, by the way, that is, uh, when it says kingdom of God, it's not talking about a physical place, something you can look at, find the walls, open the gates. That is, uh, the construction there is that the kingdom of God is wherever God is in charge, wherever God is followed. And so here God has handed off charge of the earth to mankind and said, it is good. This is all very good. Now, God never fully relinquishes his own authority. He gets to set rules for the people he's handed, given dominion to. And they had one rule in Genesis 2, 16 to 17. I'll read it for you. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so man's uh, dominion is exercised always within the will of the creator, of the real king, of the king of everything. Because this is kind of a sub-kingdom of everything. Holman's Illustrated Bible Dictionary uh, says this exact thing. It says, man exerts his rule not in arbitrary despotism, but as a responsible agent, as God's steward. And so, and, and you know the rest of the story in that fall into sin and everything, where uh, they began to exercise their dominion by making decisions that were outside the will of their overlord. And they uh, relinquished, uh, well, they, they misused their stewardship. And so now the earth is plunged into this uh, state where God's lawful authority, and in fact, his good will, his benevolent authority is not acknowledged. And uh, people go their own way to their own uh, detriment. But the idea of, of God having a kingdom has been uh, part of Old Testament thought from uh, the earliest times. So we have Adam and Eve, right, and that kind of thing. And then, and there's a few other big events. And then we get to the call of Abram. This was the call of Abram. It's recorded in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 2. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, from your kindred and your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. 
So he says he's going to make Abraham into a kingdom, right? That's a nation, a kingdom. It's uh, I'm going to make you a great place. And understood underneath that, of course, is is it's this is God's kingdom that he is giving to Abram, uh, and assuming Abram follows God, right? It's a he's going to make Abram into a great nation after God's uh, desires and heart and way of life. Now, if we move to Exodus, we see that uh, now, of course, there's a lot that's gone on between Abram and Exodus. You got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the guy with the coat of many colors, right? And the whole uh, slavery in Egypt thing. They're in Egypt for for hundreds of years, and then uh, then comes the Exodus. Uh, so there's several centuries uh, here between the last slide and this slide. And now God has brought his people out of Egypt. And this is part of the fulfillment. Uh, this is one level, maybe, you could say, of fulfillment or a, uh, a stop on the road of the fulfillment of God's promise to make out of, Na of Abram a great nation through which everybody will be blessed. This is what God says about his people. Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So in this, God is talking to Moses, telling Moses what to say to the people of Israel. And he says that my design for you, my desire for you, is that you be a treasured possession of among all the peoples. And then, of course, he reasserts his authority. He says, because all the earth is mine, uh, there's only this sort of sub-time where we feel like we have our own autonomous authority that's going to go away in the end. But he says, you shall be for to me a kingdom of priests, and the priest had a very specific function, uh, and the function of a priest is to be the go-between uh, between a god and the people. So the priests of Dagon, the priests of whoever, would be the ones who would stand in the gap, who would be between God and the people. They would bring God's word to the people and bring the people's sacrifices, offerings, whatever, to God. And so he says his, God's design for the nation of Israel as he brings them out of Egypt, out of slavery into freedom, is that they would be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, which means that he wants them to be the ones that represent God to the world. Because if you have a whole kingdom of priests, then they have to represent God to somebody else because the whole kingdom's already priests. And so we get this idea that... that um, the God is still talking kingdom talk, and he's he's sort of moving in history, building toward uh, building toward a kingdom, which I think ultimately we would recognize as a restoration of the time before God's agents, humanity, chose to act of their own accord instead of in faithful stewardship and dominion over that which. <laughs> God has entrusted to them. So we're going to jump forward a little bit, uh, another hundred years or so, uh, to the time of the judges. Let's see. This could be two or three hundred years, uh, depending on your timeline. And in the time of the judges, here is what we read about God's people. Judges 17, verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, just because there's no king in Israel doesn't mean that people aren't following God's ways because God had prophets and people like that. But here we are told that people are not following God's ways because they're all doing whatever is right in their own eyes. And so God setting up this kingdom is not going that well, really. And uh, if we move 
much further we see the people start demanding a king and they're not demanding a king so that they can follow a godly man to lead them in god's ways they're demanding a king because all the other nations have a king and we want a king too and um that's a whole sidelight but i i guess that's not really because what we're talking about is a, a god's kingdom and the kingdom god is creating and god warns them that if you have a, a king like that a physical king on earth that uh that king is going to take your daughters for his palace and take your sons for his army and he's going to take uh, taxes from all your produ the produce of your land and everything and yet they still want a king a king like that instead of just following uh, God's ways as declared by the prophets so uh, God first has Saul on the throne and Saul turns away from God and so then he goes to he calls another person to be king and that's a person turns out to be David and we see an interesting thing when God calls or anoints David to be king through his prophet so here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 verses 6 to 7 we see uh, God describing uh, the person he's looking for so uh, Jesse has a bunch of sons and they're all big strapping, you know, full grown men there. These guys are already uh, probably in the army at that point, at this point, because they're all full grown men and ready to take part in Israel's defense and that kind of thing. And so Samuel comes and he, well, I'm going to read this to you now. Samuel has come looking for one of Jesse's sons, because the Lord has revealed to him that one of Jesse's sons is his new choice for king. 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. The Lord looks, the man, excuse me, looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And later on, uh, David's called a man after God's own heart. And so we start to see there uh, the difference between other kings and kingdoms and the Lord's king, the Lord's kingdom, where God's in charge. Uh, other kings are uh, on the throne because they are the biggest and strongest. Might makes right. And here, uh, the Lord tells Samuel that the Lord is looking at David's heart. And so we see that uh, God has different criteria for his idea of a kingdom. And of course, David is, is in no way a perfect person. And yet God does make uh, a covenant with David that is a continuation of his covenant with Abram, as a matter of fact. In 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, this is what God says to David, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So that's a big deal. And, and what we're trying to do is fold all this kingdom talk when we get to the end of this, we're going to try and think a little bit about what the expectation of the Messiah might be as Jesus uh, begins his ministry and says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. And so the idea that God promised to establish the throne of David forever, the hearers of Jesus would be, this would be strongly reverberating. Uh, as Jesus uses this this phrase about the kingdom because they're expecting the restoration of David's throne because uh, for for several hundred years now they have been occupied by uh, different different uh, foreigners the land of Israel has been occupied by different foreigners even after the Babylonian exile and return to the land of Israel and so here's our are uh, Jewish people in Roman occupied Israel and they're hearing Jesus talk about the kingdom of God is at hand and they're definitely going to be thinking about verses like this one 
where God told David, your throne will be established forever. And they're trying to figure out what that means. And I'm going to let you have a chance at that too in a few minutes. So I want to give you uh, some characteristics of this kingdom, the, the, the reign of God. And, the, and we're, going to, we're going to do this whole thing from the Old Testament. That's the point of view we're looking at today. We're trying to get a flavor of the Old Testament's uh, thought and words about the kingdom of God, because that gives us the context for when Jesus begins his ministry and says the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what people are going to be thinking of. So we're going through the Old Testament. The first thing is that God's reign is everlasting. God's reign is everlasting. Psalm 145 verses 11 to 13 one of several psalms that talks about the glory, power, and everlasting nature of the kingdom of God. This psalm says this, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. And so there the psalmist singing about the kingdom of God, uh, proclaims the eternal nature of God's kingdom. And of course, we recognize that that we live in a, a fallen world that is not submitting to God as it should, not aligning our will with God's as we should. And so the psalmist is speaking about uh, God is ultimately in charge and, and his kingdom will last forever. So the first thing is we say there's no end to when God is in charge, when God has ultimate authority. The second thing is that uh, God also, from the Old Testament perspective, has a tangible kingdom through anointed leaders. First Chronicles 28 verse 5 says, and this is David speaking, and of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen Solomon my son, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So it's still the kingdom of the Lord. It's the throne of the kingdom of the Lord. And the earthly king just sits on that throne for a while. But the earthly king is expected to uh, live and reign as a servant king, as a shepherd king. And it, as long as the king reigns in that way, then the nation works, you know, more or less as God intends his holy nation and kingdom of priests to work. Uh, but as the king moves away from the idea of ruling as a steward under the Lord of Israel, then, of course, the nation moves off track as well. Isaiah 43, verse 15, God is talking, and this is what he says about himself. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. And uh, this, this is uh, Isaiah. David was, uh, in round numbers, uh, around 1000 BC. And Isaiah, in round numbers, was around 700 BC. So that you can think of those numbers, and that's fine. Um, about 300 years difference. But it's still uh, the, the God is always acknowledged as the true king of Israel. Even when Israel is defeated, even when Israel is, is in exile, the, the prophets and the psalmists continue to proclaim that God is their true king. The creator of Israel, the Lord, is their king. Psalm 103, verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. And so the, the, this kingship, there's a, a, an acknowledgement that, um, that God is ultimately the king of everything and everybody will one day submit to the true king of the earth. The Lord himself, even though right now the kings of the earth aren't 
one day uh, his kingdom will rule over all the other kingdoms. Daniel, of the Daniel and the Lion's Den fame, uh, had a vision, and this is what he wrote in Daniel 7, verses 13 to 14, about the kingdom. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So let that just kind of sink in here for a moment. We're going to look at this and a few other prophecies about the coming messianic kingdom that we've heard before if you've been involved in a church because these tend to cop, prop, crop up, excuse me, they tend to crop up every year uh, during uh, specific times in the church year, uh, Christmas and things like that. Uh, not so much this one. But in, in this particular verse, we see Son of Man, which Jesus called himself. We see that to the Son of Man is given dominion. What was given to Adam and Eve originally? Dominion, but they messed it up. So now to this Son of Man is given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Adam, uh, Adam and Eve had the kingdom and they messed it up. They had dominion and they messed it up. And then this is a new and expanded kind of thing that all peoples, nations, and languages so uh, should serve him. So that, that's kind of the great, the, it's kind of the great undoing of all the problems that sin brought into the world. Because you remember one of the things, we didn't touch on it, because, but it happened between, uh, between Genesis 3 and Genesis 12. You got the flood and you also have the Tower of Babel where the languages are confused because people are serving themselves and not God. And so when this king comes and his kingdom is established, all the peoples, nations, and languages serve him and his dominion lasts forever. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So that's a very kind of a strong God's king kind of uh, projection and expectation for the people of Israel to be living with. And let's look at a couple more of those Bible verses that generate these strong expectations for a people who are uh, oppressed and not free, who are waiting for deliverance. Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 10. Uh, you will have heard this at uh, Palm Sunday just a few weeks ago, depending on when you're listening to this, of course. Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. And so this is another one of those uh, prophecies that sets up this expectation for the kingdom of God. It doesn't use the phrase kingdom of God, but the idea of the kingdom of God is clearly in this. And this is another uh, very, would be a well-known expectation for the first century Jewish people, uh, especially as Jesus is riding in on Palm Sunday, uh, riding a donkey into Jerusalem. He's clearly going straight for this prophecy. And uh, daughter, of daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem, those are another words for the Jewish people, God's people. And then he talks about cutting off the war horse and the battle bow and bringing peace. And it's not just a local peace either. His rule, uh, he shall speak peace to all the nations. And his rule, his authority, uh, where he is in charge of, is from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. And so that's, it. again, uh, what we're trying to do here is set up the messianic kingdom expectations that Jesus walks into as he begins his ministry. 
there is a whole other strain of messianic expectations, which is the uh, suffering servant, uh, the, the, the one who is uh, uh, bruised for our iniquities and by his stripes we are healed and that, that sort of thing. But that's a different strain, right? In this particular time together, we're just trying to fill ourselves up with this expectation of the coming king, this expectation that Jesus steps into. Uh, this is a longer one. I'm going to read this one to you, though, also. So just uh, sit back and relax for a moment. This is Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. And you'll hear echoes again of uh, things that, if, if you're a regular churchgoer that are in a church that celebrates the church year, you will hear echoes of things that you have heard. Zephaniah 3, verses 14 to 20. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never fear evil again. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Wow, that is a big piece of like dreaming right for this is this is my dream for my oppressed people my my people who are beaten down and occupied this is what the lord promises when the when the king shows up in fact it says the lord your god is in your midst he will be right there he's going to deal with the oppressors uh, he's going to change your shame into praise and renown and not only that but he's going to uh bring in the ones who are a reproach, the lame, and things like that, too. And so uh, he he's going to restore the fortunes of Israel. He's going to undo what has happened. And what we're going to find out is their idea of undoing what has happened is just undoing the conquering of Israel. And God's idea of undoing what has happened goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, uh, where what happened was humanity who's supposed to have uh, uh, sub-dominion over the earth under the uh, leadership of the Lord uh, moved out from under God's leadership and God is going to deal with that through Jesus. Isaiah 9 6 to 7 every Christmas every Advent you hear it for unto us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace of the increase of his government, there's kingdom talk, and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David, that takes us back to the verse we read a little while ago, and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. So Isaiah prophesies the fulfillment of God's promise to David uh, about the coming king, who will have uh, eternal dominion. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. A couple of more Bible verses. And again, what I want you to do is hear this and just let yourself kind of, I don't know how to say this, just kind of swell up with this messianic expectation of the, the restoration of the fortunes of Israel. Just try to hear this as sort of an oppressed uh, Israelite. Jeremiah. 23, 5 to 6. Again, the, the Davidic prophecies, uh, the Davidic kingdom restoration. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, 
and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And of course, there's a lot of stuff mixed up in there. But what we're looking at today is uh, the idea of uh, David's branch, uh, someone, a descendant of David rising up to reign as king, to deal wisely and execute justice and righteousness in the land. And that is good news right there for people who are ex who are oppressed and downtrodden under the thumb of the Roman oppressors. This is a, a, a this is something they would hear and they would be looking for and hoping for. But again, this is one of the multiple lines of messianic expectations. Another one is that suffering servant one. Psalm 110 is, in fact, a psalm that Jesus quotes when he's talking about himself. David writes, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. And so there you see, uh, this is when... Jesus was quoting this. He's talking about uh, the Messiah, uh, the the coming king, which is him, actually existing before David, because uh, anybody who is just a descendant is never said to be greater than their father. And a father is a term that goes uh, can go back through many generations. So, uh, Jesus could legitimately say David is my father because he was of the line of David. But David's prophecy about the Messiah is that the Messiah would also be, this Messiah king would also be David's Lord. And so uh, Jesus uses this to indicate that, um, that, well, later on, as he said it, before Abraham was, I am. In, in that he actually uh, is, uh, in a mysterious way, the full presence of God, uh, the eternal, walking around on earth, uh, presenting himself to us. And as you can see, scepter, that's all about rule, kingdom, and the rule will be in the midst of your enemies. And so that's the strongest rule, right? If you can rule even in the midst of your enemies, then you are the most powerful ruler. So I, I pulled this kind of outline just to kind of close off now. This is the last thing before we get to the questions. This is from a book called The Dictionary of Bible Theme, Themes. And uh, this is the article on Kingdom of God, comma, coming of. And I'm not going to, it's got a bunch of Bible passages in there, you'll see. And more on the handout uh, that goes with this. But you can see uh, this kind of encapsulates what we're talking about here. And it kind of encapsulates our whole uh, message series as it's going to go on down the line for quite a few weeks here, probably. The first bullet point is the kingdom of God comes into being wherever the kingly authority of God is acknowledged. Although God is always sovereign, scripture looks to a future realm or reign of salvation. This has come in Christ, where God's authority is acknowledged, and yet it will come in its fullness only when Christ returns. And so as we walk through this timeline, it, it starts out with the acknowledgement that God is actually sovereign over Israel and the whole earth, even though we are in rebellion. And then we talk about the coming reign of God, uh, the expectations that go with that, which we spend a lot of time with today. And then uh, its association with this Messiah figure as the inaugurating this coming reign of God. And then we hear that the kingdom of God being at hand, being now, it was central to the preaching of Jesus and the apostles. And then the kingdom of God has come in Christ. And that's kind of where we're going to be spending the rest of the, the many weeks now as we listen to Jesus try to tell us about the kingdom of God in stories. The kingdom is the kingdom of God's like a, a pearl merchant who who finds the most amazing pearl he's ever seen. The kingdom of God is like 
a man who finds a treasure in a field. The kingdom of God is like a, a shepherd who loses a sheep. Uh, the kingdom of God is like a lot of different things. And so Jesus is trying to help us uh, build in our minds uh, not just a, a intellectual picture of the kingdom of God that we're going to be studying over these next few weeks, not just an intellectual picture, but I would say even an emotional picture uh, because our life is not just built on our ideas, it's built on our emotions as well. And when we study these stories of the kingdom of God is like, if we really let those stories speak to us, we're going to feel a lot of emotions. We're going to feel the emotion of a son who has uh, betrayed his father and went away and then coming home, hoping at least his dad will give him a job because uh, he knows his dad's a decent guy and he has no right to expect anything. We're going to feel the emotion of a guy who's out hiking and finds a treasure hidden in someone else's field. And, uh, and all of that is part of the kingdom of God that has come in Christ and blooms in each of us. And then, of course, uh, the final return of Christ is when this kingdom of God uh, finds its ultimate fulfillment in, 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 the, in the reign uh, of Christ where uh, not just those of us who uh, seek Christ and are looking for Christ and are, are um, looking for ways to make this true, but where the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Uh, and that, of course, will bring glory to God the Father. But let's not glance over the fact that every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. That's the master. That's the ruler. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is truly in charge and Jesus truly reigns and rules in this earth. So that's kind of our Old Testament sweep through. We've seen a lot about the restoration of the, the kingdom, uh, of, about this reign and rule forever coming from uh, the line of Abram and then David. And we've seen the restoration happen uh, that, or at least the expectation that there's going to be a restoration where God's in charge through this king who will come from David's line. And that's the expectation that Jesus walks into. Now, just to close off, some questions for discussion. Question number one, have you ever chafed under authority? Number two, how does this expectation of a coming king mesh with or contradict the Messiah who is beaten for our iniquities and by his stripes we are healed? Number three, how might you feel and what might you be thinking if you as a first century Jew heard Jesus preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand? Number four, how do you see the Old Testament preparing people for Jesus? Number five, what do you think of when you, as yourself now, hear the phrase kingdom of God or, or kingdom of heaven? And then, of course, I never let things go without an open-ended question on the end. What else strikes you? You have been listening to, if you made it this far, or watching, Dig Deeper, which are Bible enrichment studies for individuals and small groups that we publish nearly every week here at Journey of Life Lutheran Church in the Lake Nona area of Orlando, Florida. Our website is www.journeyoflife.org. From there, you can find all sorts of other resources, including uh, audio uh, recordings of the sermons. You can find YouTubes of the sermons or the entire service every Sunday. If you can't make it to church, that's a great resource for you. Uh, you all, there's also on there the opportunity to financially support our church if you want to help uh, keep these kind of things going. And uh, more than anything, I'm just sincerely glad, if you're hearing my voice now, that you're still listening because the scriptures have uh, the, the good news, the best news of all for our lives, that uh, God is undoing the damage that's been done. And he can do that inside each of our hearts. He can do that in our com in communities as we follow him. And he's going to ultimately do that in the world as Jesus showed that he triumphed over the worst, the world, and whatever powers exist in the world have to offer. Death itself, when he came out of the grave, that we celebrate every year on Easter morning. 
That is good news. So thanks for listening and God bless you.